said before, we're delighted um, to have with us today um, Jan Campbell and Stephanie Seville. And um, Stephanie is going to be talking about the, the Museum of Medicine and Health, um, based in the University of Manchester, of biology, medicine and health. And she's going to explain how it became into being and looking at the collections and she'll highlight some of the, the wonders of that museum as well. Um, and all we, we also have Jan, um, and Jan is gonna be talking about the uh, fascinating history of social prescribing, which I guess in the last couple of years has kind of seen um, an expansion of, um, of this area of work and looking at um, sort of social prescribing link workers and the ambition um, of, of those workers to work with people, particularly around mental health. And but is social prescribing a new thing? Well, Jan is going to explain to us um, um, the history of that um, in a fascinating presentation, um, which, which I've also had the honour to already see, and it's really, really interesting. So Without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Steph, who's going to kick us off this afternoon um, with a presentation. And as I say, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. And again, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Karen. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's so nice to be able to share the stories of the museum and with a new audience and um, some of you heard of the museum before of course but um, to some of you it'll be completely new so I'll share my screen now. So hello um, like, um, like we said it, my name's Stephanie and I'm the heritage officer for the Museum of Medicine and Health and this is a museum collection which is in the biology medicine and health faculty based at the University of Manchester. Um, thank you for inviting me and um, want to share some of the stories in, in the museum with you today. As well as the University of Manchester cultural institutions, so the Whitworth Art Gallery, Manchester Museum, and um, there are many cultural assets across the campus as well. This image is um, of the Instruments of Change exhibition in the foyer of the Stockford building where we are based. So this is the, this, the, uh, the building in the university where uh, this, the medical school is based today. Um, but even in this building um, of um, young doctors being trained, et cetera, um, there are these pockets of heritage. So um, anyone can come and see this exhibition. And um, this is in the foyer area, which requires no pass or ID. So if you do fancy coming, uh, check out the website and then um, do pop along on Oxford Road. So the University of Manchester has a long history of medical research, teaching and breakthroughs. And um, this is, one way in through this exhibition how we share those stories of how the university has helped shape uh, patient care. So this is a slide which um, highlights some of the um, history of the hospitals in Manchester and um, in particular the um, Manchester Royal Infirmary. So from 1754 to 1908 the Manchester Royal Infirmary was located at Piccadilly Gardens area that's the image on the left. But in 1909, it moved to a new site, Oxford Road. The move was controversial um, and doctors generally supported the move, uh, however, as it meant better facilities, um, a new building, a new site, the, and the potential of working more closely with the university's medical education and research. So that would really was key. So that's the Manchester Royal Infirmary. So the change of location from the Piccadilly Gardens area to closer to the university campus area. So with the move to Oxford Road, uh, we were closer to the teaching institutions. Um, so this is a photograph on the left of the, um, the old medical school um, at Coupland Street building. Um, the building's still there and it's been renovated and um, myself and the museum volunteers, honorary on, on curators um, actually visited um, last week, which was really exciting. Um, it had opened in 1873. And the photograph um, on the right is the um, dissection room before its refurbishment in the 1920s. So it's a really nice um, series of photographs that are in the archives at the university, which, which depict the inside of the building as it was as well. So um, all the, the kind of work and dissection work that would have been going on in there was fascinating, I'm sure. 
However, by the 1960s, um, the original medical school, school building was no longer able to cope with the increasing number of medical students uh, required for the new increased services of the NHS. So the, 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 the formation of the NHS really changed the way that medical education was, was looked on. Um, and really, this building couldn't cope uh, any longer. So a, a new building was needed. Um, when the old this old medical school building nothing was left uh, closed and was just you know decided to close and something new built and um, nothing was left behind so there were a number of old instruments things that people had collected and everything moved to the new um, medical school the museum um, today of which this um, collection formed the core and the origins of um, in, in, contains over 8,000 instruments and equipment today and spans um, nearly 300 years of, of history. So this is an artist's impression of the Stockford building, um, which replaced the old medical school, uh, which was completed in 1973. It was planned in response to the increasing numbers of medical professionals needed in the NHS and it became the largest university building in the UK at the time. As well as the medical school, it was designed to house sciences of different disciplines, uh, physiology, biochemistry, microbiology, pharmacology, and the medical school's executive dean, uh, Dr. Bezik, um, which who you can see there on the image, um, was the driving force behind the project and really had a lot of responsibility with the design, um, the purpose and the function of the new building. Dr. Bezik travelled the world with the architect to ensure that the very best and most modern facilities were used. The building was dubbed a skyscraper on its side, um, as it is so large, and, and if anyone who's wandered around it um, or wandered inside it knows how easy it is to get lost in there. Um, they even considered um, one um, copying one medical school in Europe that hung their cadavers vertically, um, but that was that was that was an a, abandoned idea. Um, you can see in the image there the Holy Name Church, which is just next door to us, and obviously that's still here. And the site was um, had originally um, housing on it, and the um, land was purchased and, and cleared for the purpose of, of building the Stockford building. So it's quite an interesting development of that area of Oxford Road as well. The museum the collection that was established when the old medical school closed um, and the new one opened um, was looked after by Dr. Bezik and, and Dr. Bezik's wife, um, Charlotte Bezik. She became the first curator of the, of the museum and really um, increased its intake, um, improved its cataloging, created a museum collection. So we owed a lot to her to get this um, collection going. So just some of the stories to highlight and um, which are interesting. Um, we do, the objects in the collection do complement what's in um, already held in the um, university special collections um, medical archive at the main library on campus, not too far away from the building. Um, it's off, they often echo the personal papers of various people and professors and, and med researchers, et cetera. And um, in particularly Professor Mitchell, um, his papers are held in the, in the university archive and we hold some of the objects which relate to his work and research. So uh, Professor Mitchell kept a private collection of historical medical instruments in his office. And this is a photograph from the old medical school on Crookland Street. This is the inside interior of his office and um, where he scurried away um, um, a few items of interest to him. He was interested in the history of medicine as well and quite a large chunk of objects um, formed the core of the, the original museum collection. Um, he is famous for his research on penicillin during the Second World War. He became professor of anatomy at the university from 1946, straight after the war. And um, he was instrumental in changing medical operations uh, through his research into antibiotics during the war. He served in the Royal Army Medical Corps in the Middle East and North Africa, and he pioneered the use of surgery, uh, of penicillin in military surgery. So one, a couple of the items that we've got here is um, really reflects his work, um, and in particular this uh, penicillin syringe. So this was to prevent, um, used on soldiers to prevent wound infection on the D-Day landings um, in particular. And um, it saved thousands of soldiers' lives, and he was awarded an OBE in 1945. This is a really interesting angle of, of, um, of his research, I think, and uh, places him in importance in sort of world history as well, I think. Um, 
the, the collection is quite surprising how it'll turn up um, stories of social history, military history, as well as medical history and, and healthcare history. So it's one of our star items in the collection, certainly. Have a look. Mitchell helped to re-establish the medical school after the Second World War and re this restructure of teaching of anatomy. One of his early rules was to ban students smoking in the dissection room. Um, he was interested in historical medical research and his donations um, totaled more than 150 items when they came to us in the Stockford building. Um, the, on the left here is a teaching slide um, which shows a penicillin culture um, which um, came which was sent to him from the office of Alexander Fleming as well. So there's quite some interesting links there to a bigger picture of medical research. So another um, person I want to highlight is Dr. Catherine Chisholm. Um, in relation to her impact on healthcare in Manchester in particular. So she was interested in all aspects of women's health. Um, however, her ambition, her ambition was to specialise in children's diseases. She was active in the infant welfare movement, advisor to the Santa Fe Fina Society for Crippled Children, medical officer for the Manchester High School for Girls and honorary physician for women and children. Um, so she really had a lot of influence in the city um, and made her mark on, on, on uh, women's and children's health. From 1911, she was advisor to the, medical, uh, the Manchester Child and Welfare Committee, and she was concerned with the high level of infant, infant mortality. Um, in 1914, um, after many years of, of campaigning for it, she founded the Manchester Babies Hospital, and this was later changed, um, the name was changed to the Duchess of York Hospital for Babies, in, and this was located in Burnage. So here we can see a photograph of her not long after graduation, um, and on the left are some of the sunlight wards, um, so you can see that the beds uh, for the children have been moved outside, and, and that was in order to maximise their exposure to the sunlight and vitamin D. Dr Chisholm was the very first female student to join the Medi Manchester Medical School in 1898 and she graduated from medicine in 1904. So in another way, she was a pioneer. And here are some photographs um, which are contained within a unique uh, photograph album um, that was presented to Dr Chisholm in 1951 on her retirement by the people that worked with her on various committees and in the hospital and um, somebody had um, amassed um, a, a real history since 1914 um, charting different pinpoints in, in the history of the, of the hospital with extensions, new wings and um, uh, new staff, significant surgeons, and it's a lovely album um, that that uh, that records this history, and obviously was was presented to her with fond memories. It, it's it's obviously very nostalgic, and there's some lovely images here of the of the children. But it is an honest depiction of hospital treating sick babies and small um, and small children. And um, for me, the, notably, like the parents are absent. That you know the, the, the children are being cared for by these healthcare professionals of the day. Um, surgery was very common here. Surgery was performed for um, glue ear, for cleft lip, palate, um, and. One of the surgeons in particular that we highlight in the museum um, is uh, Mrs. Florence Kavanagh, and she was a um, one of the best surgeons in the country at the time um, for ENT. And she worked here and um, for, had her, a, a lot of her career here. Um, the hospital is no longer there, and many in the, from, but many of the instruments that were used at the hospital in surgery um, are in the museum collection. Um, in 19, another individual just to finish on, um, in 1956, Sir Harry Platt, um, Professor of Orthopaedic Surgery at the University of Manchester, was committed to investigate hospital care of children. His result uh, was the report, The Welfare of Children in Hospital in 1959, and it became known, dubbed as the Platt Report, and it result, resulted in the reorganisation of how children were treated in hospital. So this is one of the stories that we feature in the in the exhibition in the foyer of the Stockford building, because his, uh, what Harry Platt did is um, actually had a knock on effect of how children were, were treat, treated in hospital. 
So many of his recommendations were based on the good practice at the Children's um, Duchess of York Hospital, which we've just looked at some of the photographs of, of that Chis uh, Dr Chisholm set up herself. Before this report, um, it was common for children to be treated on adult wards, especially if they required surgery. Um, but Platt believed that the most damaging aspect of hospital stays was the limited contact um, allowed between children and their parents. He recommended that children should be placed on wards with children of the same age groups. He said they should have facilities for inside and outside play, colour schemes that would, should be cheerful in the rooms, um, and he insisted that parents be allowed to visit children whenever possible, and that they be able to keep their personalised possessions at their side of, of the hospital beds. So really, some the, a lot of these things seem obvious to us um, and much needed. We're not on now, are they? So we've missed that bit. And anyone that's um, been into the Children's Hospital at Manchester knows that there, there's a lot of thought put behind um, this to make children feel comfortable and their families. And um, so it just sort of highlighted to me, looking into the history, how, how actually um, difficult the experience would have been for some people. There's a quote um, here that um, we've reflected, and this is um, an oral history quote which has been collected by the NHS at 70 team uh, which you may have heard of and that's a national project to record memories about the NHS working in the NHS but experiences of the NHS um, which is the lead um, project is being led from the University of Manchester and um, so this is just one of the quotes so I won't read it all but it just reflects how a little girl um, so young I think she was about six um, was getting upset and um, upset um, and she had to peep to see her parents that um, had managed to sneak onto the ward um, and unfortunately the, the staff weren't very accommodating and, and would would um, take her back to the bed and she couldn't then see her mum and dad so it was it was quite it's quite um, uh, sad really I think um, to, to think about her experience and she obviously has remembered it because you know decades and decades later is re reflecting this um, to the people recording her memories. So just something to, to stick with me really. Um, so just wanted to highlight on a little bit of work of the museum today um, and some of the examples of engagement and using the collection. Um, so we work with students um, at the University of Manchester in teaching and learning, giving opportunities to practice exhibitions and collections work. And um, we will, pass the details to the um, Histories Festival team and um, because we're having an exhibition of items which is led by the Art Gallery Museum Study students in December at Central Library and that's a that's the image on the top left is a, a previous exhibition that they've held so we, you may be interested in coming along to that on the day to see some actual objects in in person um, and we work with researchers who want to increase their public engagement experience and we re reach out to academics across the university and in particular at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library as well and um, to hopefully integrate objects within archive um, research as well. And we work with school groups so you can see some of the school groups there learning about how blood is transferred um, through the body and um, of which we have lots of related items um, to blood sciences. So I just want to finish on a slide uh, which shows the exhibition again and um, like I said it, it is open to the public and um, as such as whenever the Stockford building is open you can have pop in and have a look and do feedback if there's any feedback because in any we are after some um, feedback um, from the exhibition um, so, um, to see how you find it so I'll stop sharing now thanks for listening and I'll hand over to Jan and look forward to a good discussion afterwards Thanks, Stephanie. I thought that was fabulous. Um, and you just brought back to me a memory of many years ago. In the 1960s, my dad was in hospital and I went in to visit him as a, as a child. And that there was a child on the ward and he introduced me to this child because the child had nobody to play with in the hospital because it was an adult's hospital. Um, and, you know, it, it's just the work that you... Um, was done through the Platt report and the work that you, Catherine Chislett did have, have changed and shaped the way that we view medicine and healthcare today. But one of the things that struck me was that, you know, it does take time for things to change and that 
sometimes it can take decades and sometimes centuries and uh, you I suppose it's that thing of it's really interesting to reflect back on what's happened to help us understand how we've got to where we are today and hopefully to help us to build a better future going forward um, so I'm going to say thank you to Karen as well for the introduction and that I'm going to apologize as well because um, I've made some changes to the presentation for today so I hope that the one that I do today is is as good as the one that I did when Karen was there and, and if not please feel free to just let me know and I, I can always I'm always looking forward to improving things things do get better um, with feedback so um, I'm, I'm going to start sharing my screen now and just take you through um, a story of social prescribing that's maybe moving back in time rather than forwards in time and just looking at what social prescribing is. And so I'll share my screen and hopefully with the magic of technology, we'll be able to just move backwards in time. I'm saying that, it's just gonna work. There we go, have we, we got that? Uh, there's a bit of a lag, I think, on my um, slides, but I'm just going to start off by introducing myself. My name is Jan Campbell and I work for two organisations. I work for Sefton Council for Voluntary Service and I work for the National Academy for Social Prescribing. Um, I work for the, the CVS, the Council for Voluntary Service, and I just thought I'd explain a bit about what that does because I'm not sure who's on the call and what you will understand by some of that phraseology. So a, a Council for Voluntary Service brings together voluntary community, faith, and social enterprise organizations, bringing them together to try and work to provide support and services within the communities that they serve. So they generally are particularly within uh, sorry, they're generally within a, a particular locality and uh, they work within that locality. Um, what we have done in Sefton is we've been working there for 40 odd years, but I know that there are CVSs across Manchester and I work particularly closely with a colleague in Salford CVS, Bruce Poole. He's also part of the National Academy for Social Prescribing Thriving Communities team. And together we are trying to work alongside Christine Blythe from Lancashire to try and promote thriving communities across the Northwest. And the, Thriving Communities as part of the Social Prescribing Academy's framework to try and support an expansion and development of social prescribing. So I suppose the question then is, well, what is social prescribing? Um, well, the King's Fund describes social prescribing as um, sometimes uh, being referred to as community referral. And that means enabling health professionals to refer people to a range of local non-clinical services. The referrals are generally but not exclusively come from professionals working in primary care settings. By that they mean GPs and practice nurses. Um, so what do they refer people on to and why? And why is this social prescribing? Well, one of the things that has been known to GPs for many years is that often the patients that they say come with issues that can't be directly addressed through a medical treatment, that even if they come with a medical condition, um, if they come with bronchitis, if they come with diabetes, if they come with uh, a mental illness, that in many instances, although there are medical treatments available, there are other issues that require additional support in that, the places that people live, the foods that they eat, the activities they engage in can help or hinder the effectiveness of the treatment they're receiving. And also the prognosis in terms of the, path, the pathology of the condition and where that's likely to, to lead to. And so social prescribing is a means by which medical professionals can prescribe something other than a medical treatment, other than a clinical treatment. 
that it provides access to a range of other support services. So social prescribing is one of the key components of a, an approach which has been developing particularly over the last 10 years, which is known as universal personalized care. It's an approach to the provision of health care and support, which goes beyond the medical treatment and looks at what matters to you rather than what's the matter with you. It's an attempt to try and make the response to people's health care needs more personalized and more effective. Partly, it's about encouraging people to look at the assets and resources that help them to live life to the full, to live a healthy life based on what matters to them. And for each of us, we may have different interests, different activities that we want to engage in. And so through the National Academy for Social Prescribing, we have links with a number of different organizations that work in the arts arena, heritage, culture, sports, nature, financial services, and other organizations as well, particularly within the voluntary faith and community organization. And that one of the things which has uh, been used as a, a phrase to exemplify what we mean by uh, personalized approach, it's really about finding the way of helping people to live life, to get a life rather than to necessarily just receive a service. And um, I just think of an example that was shared with me by um, a chap called William Bird, who if you get the chance to hear him speak, he's brilliant. Um, and that he used the example of, we know if somebody has uh, diabetes and that they feel depressed and that they may suffer with their, their weight, they may be obese, that um, something that would be helpful is some sort of physical activity that it would help to um, help them to, to gain better control of their diabetes. But how do we encourage somebody who feels low in mood to engage in physical activity? What can we do to encourage them to get active? Well, people might suggest that they could maybe get off the bus a, step, a stop earlier, um, that maybe they could choose rather than to get the lift when they get taking their shopping up to their flat, that they could you know, walk up sets of stairs. But as he says, why would you want to do those things? Where's the, where's the benefit? Where's the thing that matters to them in that? And so he uses an example of a chap he calls Bob and that Bob particularly likes football and he likes going to, to watch his favorite football team. And so if we can find a way of encouraging Bob to walk to the football match rather than getting the bus to the football match, we can encourage Bob to get involved in an activity that's good for him and that he will enjoy and that he will continue to do and that he will engage in as a social activity and that he'll get the benefits in terms of his health, but that what he will be doing will be receiving a social prescription. And so there are now schemes where people can get subsidized tickets to football matches based on the, um, them walking a certain amount of, of distance to be able to, to meet up with people prior to the match, to watch the match and watch the match. And that this is beneficial to them in terms of their health. And this is very much a social model of health. So the model, the personalization model takes a biopsychosocial approach to health. So it tries to bring together um, an approach to health, which not only looks at the medical and the biological, but looks at the psychological in terms of mental well-being and the social context in terms of the health that people experience within their community. And I think you know, in, in terms of Manchester, there was a report by Marmot quite recently on the impacts of COVID. And very much it was saying that that social context was a big contributor in terms of the impacts of COVID in, on the, the population in Manchester. So this biopsychosocial model and this social prescribing model 
has been um, the timeline around it has been taken back to the 1990s where um, uh, a number of regional and local schemes began to develop and that these schemes were sporadic so that there was no consistency within them and that what we can see it isn't really until the 2010s that we begin to get some more consistency in the provision of social prescribing and that that timeline that you see on your screen um, what that indicates is some of the major steps that led to where we are today um, that in the long-term plan for social prescribing there is an ambition to see an expansion of this personalized care su and support through there being 4,000 social prescribing link workers across the country helping people to link into these social resources to the assets within our communities. But I would suggest that we could have been here a lot quicker if we hadn't perhaps gone a little bit awry back in the 17th century. And I know this is quite a leap back in time, but really a lot of what um, Stephanie was talking about and the possibilities and that scientific discoveries that were, uh, were, were discovered during the uh, 18th century and the 19th century, many of that, those things would not have been possible had we not had a change of direction in the 17th century when um, a philosopher called Descartes talked about how it was possible to look to separate the mind from the body and that what he set out was a division that enabled us to treat the body separately from the mind and this enabled and made it much easier to have that separation from the mind and the spirit and the, the sense of self and the body as um the, the body is an object, the body is something that could be studied objective, objectively and it could be treated differently. Um, and so what you get in the development of medicine is during that time, you get a move in terms of the way we view the body and the person. And that there's a, a wonderful, um, a, there's a wonderful um, piece of work written by a chap called Juson, um, which is the disappearance of the sick man from medical cosmology, 1770 to 1870, where what he describes is how the, the person, the sick man, is no longer within the vision of the, the medical profession as it becomes increasing, increasingly focused on the scientific model. And so he describes has this move from bedside medicine where there is a, a practitioner and a person and the, the, the practitioner looks at the person as a totality to that development of hospital medicine. And it was interesting that you, know, Stephanie was talking about that need to move out of buildings and change the shapes of building as medicine and hospital medicine grew in this clinical approach where the important issue was to diagnose and classify what was happening um, to begin to look at it in terms of organic processes and how that then progressed beyond that to looking at laboratory medicine, which is this very scientific approach where we look at things in terms of cell complexes and this very much a biochemical process rather than the totality of the sick man. And that really the, the divisions that were enabled by this different way of thinking that Descartes had proposed have large ramifications. And it was suggested to me earlier today that you know, it, it may even have played a part in terms of Manchester's industrial revolution, in terms of the way that labor was viewed and people's, you know, their bodies were used um, to propel that um, expansion of Manchester as a, as a city and part of the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Because one of the things that ran alongside this, which was separate from medicine and wasn't integrated because we no longer saw that sort of totality, 
were the social determinants as we would describe them to, today, but poverty in very many senses as it was um, historically. And so from 1601, uh, you know, we've got a number of poor laws being enacted to try and address the, the, the issues of those social determinants, the social aspects of health. And that it was actually in response to some of the amendments in terms of the poor law reforms that led to the formation of the CVSs. So that council of voluntary service that I talked about right back at the beginning, you know, where you know, voluntary sector organizations came together to try and address this issue of you know, people, poor people were dying sooner, they were getting much ill sooner, and how could that be addressed? And so even though we've been on a, a very long um, meander through different approaches to, to medicine and health, we are beginning to try and sew back together those different social, psychological, and physical health elements in terms of the biopsychosocial model that underpins that sort of um, approach to social prescribing. Um, and that in many ways, you, if we, we go even further, we can see that you know, historically, before we had that medical model, before we had the scientific model, approaches did take a more holistic view of people. Not particularly one that I would advocate that we follow in terms of you know, this, the humor approach, the humor's approach to health um, suggested that you know, different humors move through the body and could be treated in different ways by things like bloodletting. And I think, you know, Science, science has, has led us a long way, so you know, um, I'm not advocating we go back to that, but I'm certainly saying that you know, the, the holistic approach which brings together biopsychosocial elements is certainly where we're looking at the moment and is part of our future and comes from our past. An area that I would suggest to you that we don't look at quite as much as maybe we need to do as we're moving forward is that thing about the role of people as lay referrers in terms of health and well-being and in terms of medicine. And that this is a really interesting area that we don't look at and perhaps maybe more people need to be looking at as we, as we go forward as to how we use our voices to encourage that positive approaches to health and medicine. Um, and that we can do that by sharing, I think, We've seen some of that through COVID, haven't we, where you people are sharing with each other that you know the importance of hands, face, space. And so those lay messages, the, the way we talk to each other about our health is, is growing in, in importance. So I think I've romped through history there. I've taken you through two uh, yeah, two thousand years of medical approaches and I think that's probably enough at this point so thank you very much for listening to me and I'd be interested to hear if any questions thoughts comments anybody has so thanks very much I'm going to end share now thank you both for um fascinating talks there um again our audience if you have any questions that you'd like to ask please do put them in the chat um, to get us going, maybe uh, a bit of kind of conversation, because it was quite interesting from both perspectives there on the changes in health and how we treat people through the different centuries, you know, this kind of move towards, you know, um, separating the mind and body to coming back more today around, you know, trying to get things like social prescribing and other methods of treating the whole person as you know not just the body but the, again that kind of coming together I was just I was just wondering whether you could elaborate a bit more on that in terms of how you, you know going forward and practices um, could could have an impact on the history of, of basically what happens next so that my dog is barking now because someone's at the door <laughs> so in in terms of moving forward I think that um, we have at the moment nationally there are about 2,000 social prescribing link workers if you'd have gone back five years ago there would have been hardly any 
social prescribing link workers and that the ambition is by 2024 for there to be 4,000 of those roles within the, the, the health system, within the broader health system. And that in terms of using those roles, people, um, you know, if you go to your GP and that you present yourself with a particular issue, it may be that you'll be prescribed a social prescribing link worker and that what they, um, their role really is to try and identify what matters to you in terms of what's the issue that is impacting on your health currently that needs to be addressed. Uh, I mean, for example, you know, for a GP, it may be that the issue that they would want to treat might be um, a, a leg ulcer. Um, but for you as a person, the thing that you that matters to you is that your house has got damp in it. And so that what the social prescribing link worker can do is help you to address the issues of the damp within the house that then will then help you to address the issues of perhaps why the legals is not healing and why that's not working. So that you know, at the same time as the doctor is providing the prescription for the medical element, the, the social prescribing link workers providing the social element and through combination of these, they, um, they serve to work towards achieving better health outcomes for the individuals themselves. But I think one of the things that um, I was trying to illustrate, I think is that part of the, what has happened is that the way we talk about health and illness has changed in that we've, we don't talk about health as much as we talk about illness and conditions and that we see doctors as being the prescribers of answers to illness and that we perhaps historically talked more about health and the elements that contributed to health um, and that you know, historically we would have talked more about foods that people got benefit from and things that people could do that might bring them benefit. I've got to say some of that, you know, because it's that thing of always being careful what you're advocating for, because some of it you would say, please don't try and do that at home. Um, but there are some aspects of the, the lay conversations around what contributes to good health that perhaps empowered people more to, to to build the resource that they have for themselves to address the health part, which then may make that illness treatment more effective. <laughs> yeah, just I suppose the, the way that, yeah, language is used around um, disease and health, and I think that's a good point. Um, the, the penicillin syringe that I shared with you, um, often, you know, that is literally an item that was used during com a conflict, the World War, and to treat soldiers and and we and and it was also used to fight infection and those are kind of words that we use against microbes we're killing disease we're fighting something and we're battling other things so it's just that there's some discussion at the moment about those about those attacking wor those those words and whether they should be less yeah attacking and less sort of, of juxtaposed with with the condition um, so it's quite interesting to me at the moment thinking about that language it's just a couple of um, questions on the chat. I think Stephanie, you've um, you've said um, one question was who opposed the move of the infirmary from Piccadilly and why? And I think you said you were going to maybe look into that a little bit more. You got yeah, I can do. Yeah, whether it was a just a I'll have, I'll have to ask Peter and Julie, um, whether um, whether it was a ch you know the general change and people fearing that change and, and the relocation. Um, I don't know, so I'll, I'll I'll look into it. Thank you, Keith. It was yeah. And the other thing was the um, NHS project you were talking about, the you know NHS at seventy. How 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 would people access that? Or I'll put the link to their web pages in the chat now. And um, it's a fascinating project. And um, it's like I said, it's a national campaign. It was a national um, to collect oral histories. Um, so it's not my work, but it is the work that's led from the same faculty as me um, in the university. Um, and they are, they were pre-COVID recording um, 
thousands of oral histories about experiences of the NHS from both sides. Um, but since COVID, they've ch the project has now changed focus to capturing COVID memories and COVID experiences. Um, and they continue to collect over the phone during that lockdown period, which, is, which was quite, um, you know, adapted the, the project. So I'll put the link in now. Um, and that collection of oral histories, which are so important um, in archives, um, is being collected by the British Library. So it's going to become part of the National Oral History um, collection of the of the of Britain. So that's that's fascinating. <coughs> that in. There was a, a question here, um, which I think is more for you, Jan, is it, it asks about will the holistic approach be hindered by the restriction on face-to-face -face GP consultants consultations, sorry. Uh, I would say um I think not. And I think if anything, it, um, you know, it it's possibly adds grist to the mill in terms of um, you, the, the things that help to enhance people's um, daily lives, the, the things that are important to them uh, are, can be provided through those engagement with a, a wider range of resources rather. So the, you know, the, the treatment of the medical condition requires the, you know, the, the input of the, the GP directly. But you know, if it's a housing issue, um, if it's about low mood, um, particularly I think many people in terms of COVID recovery are being um, directed towards social prescribing link workers so that they can engage in community activity that supports them with the recovery. So small steps, um, they're engaging in craft groups, um, in walking groups, um, that there are so many different elements that can potentially contribute to better health and well-being outcomes. And one of the things that struck me with the pictures, it was lovely the pictures that were there of the children's hospital and about children outside playing and having fun and you know, that all being seen as part of their recovery. But what we've not really done with adults is seen how important those positive things, those uplifting elements of life for adults are in terms of recovery. You know, adults need to have fun too. And that if the things that they are doing is fun, that they continue to do those things. It's a bit like the Bob example, you know, he wouldn't continue to walk upstairs carrying his shopping because, well, where's the where's the fun in that? Whereas walking to the football match, yeah, there's fun in that. Thank you. Um, a, a couple more questions. One is about how do you actually get people to accept help? Um, one, one of our um, viewers is saying that my late mother-in-law was always very resistant as she felt it wasn't, it wasn't her choice and people who didn't know her were telling her what she should and shouldn't do. I think this is, this is very much part of the personalisation approach and that it's going to be very varied across the country. Um, the, there's actually there's been a recent report on social prescribing and inequality that said that it is varied across the country. Um, but the, the thing is about the, the tailoring to the person. Um, I have just seen some um, a great example of how um, this was particularly with children. Um, there's some children who needed, they had cerebral palsy and they needed to do some hand exercises and these hand exercises were very repetitious and that they had to repeat them hundreds of times and they were dreadfully boring. Um, and the, somebody had the idea of um, getting a magician to, because magicians, it's all about sleight of hand. And so the magician, taught these children tricks and they taught card tricks to the children and so the children did the same exercises that they would have been doing had they had the quite boring therapy but effectively they were having the therapy but they were having it through this use of magic and that that really worked for them there's, there's seen others where then you know, people have um Again, it's been musculoskeletal things where drumming has been a, a thing that 
you know, they don't want to engage in something that is boring. One of, I don't know about this lady's mother, but one of the things that often people say is they don't want to go to some of these things because they're full of old people. Um, you know, this is particularly when you're talking to people in their 80s. They don't want to go because they're just full of old people. Um, well, so we shouldn't be having things that are just full of old people. You know, it's activities cross generations. You know, if you like drumming, it doesn't matter what age you are, you know, and the projects that enable people to pursue the things, activities that enable people to pursue the things that they enjoy doing are the things that work, not ones that are specifically targeted at, you know, people who were born in 1948, you know, that's just, it's a, a random thing, isn't it? It's, it's more important that you do what you want to do that fulfills you in life. Thank you. Um, Steph, I think there's a question here for you about uh, uh, some evidence in, Mitchell in Mitchell's papers who you mentioned that you had um, of his working with a, a Professor Wilson Baker on penicillin. Um, um, yeah, I've replied, I've sent a link just oh, later okay. on in the chat, um, which links to the special collections uh, reference, I think, for the, for the Mitchell papers. So if you did want to follow it up and have a closer look yourself, um, Diana put that, I think in the chat and um, that's the link to it it may it, i think it just i suppose that the question raises the fact that there's many different disciplines will have all contributed to to work together to get to an end goal and it wasn't just um you know uh, uh, mitchell um, concerned with anatomy and and um, working towards things it was lots of different disciplines within the sciences um um so yeah i suppose it just raises that really I I'm not entirely sure if the papers um, sum up the penicillin research or whether they are weighted towards his role once he was in the University of Manchester. So that's something to, to highlight. Thank you. Can I, can I just say something? Um, are, they, are his papers with you or are they in the Rylands Library? Yeah, they're in the special collections, live um, Ryland's collections. Yeah, uh, because yeah. they're an archive and paper based, they are within the library, but they're based at the main library on Oxford Road. That in the medical. Yes, not I, uh, um, not at the um, John okay. Ryland's library. Yeah, I think they're they're based with the medical um, archives. So oh, we, cool. yeah, we we t we have passed a number of different archival material to to the archives in recent years, just to, because they'll be able to look after it um, better. Um, but that's always been there, as far as I know. I better explain. I used to be the deputy university librarian and the associate director of the John Rylands Library, so that's why I'm asking. Really? The question. All right. Oh, lovely! Oh, I work at the John Rylands as well, part time, so I love it there. <laughs> right, good. We we need to talk because. Um, Obviously, I did a lot of work um, with this, um, and I do a talk about uh, prosthetics, which is based on some of the prosthetics that you've got. Oh, fantastic. Yes. And there was actually a student called Gemma Reed who worked on that when she was a student in the Chisholm department. Oh, fantastic. Yes, we have a lot to do with them. And, um, yeah. Yes, great. Oh, lovely. Do, I'll do come and chat to you one day. All right. Yes, do. Yes. I'm aware that we've only got a, a few minutes left now um, before before we close today. Um, and um, there are a few other questions around, you know, what's next for social prescribing? Um, how is it decided where social prescribing links workers are located? And um, assume, assume nowhere near enough for GP surgeries, and whether that's a, a statement. But again, um, I don't know whether he wants just to kind of round up um, anything. I mean, from Manchester History's point of view, we, we have had the pleasure of working with Jan and looking and working with the National Academy of Social Prescribing to look particularly how heritage can support people um, through that kind of method. And we are looking at um, doing some of um, activities um, next year where we can work with some social prescribing um, connectors, if you like, to be able to ensure that you know history um, and our stories are told as a way of looking at our, our identity who we are where we come from and I think that all helps to support you know our mental sort of health and well-being really and how important really heritage is um, to 
to to and arts and culture is to um, you know people's well being. Um, Jan, you mentioned around fun, uh, uh, as with the children. You know, so it's a it's a, a a great area of work, and I think the heritage and cultural sector is really well placed to enable some of these activities um, to take place. Um, and um, so we're very um, you know. We're very much looking forward to seeing how heritage can have an impact on that and, and using the social prescribing model to enable us to um, chat to more people, open up um, channels of communication and to improve people's mental health, health and well-being. Um, so that's just a little sorry spout from me there, but just you know how excited we are about doing the, the training that, that we did with you, Jan, and um, looking forward. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. I don't know whether um, anyone wants to have some any closing um, thoughts um, before we go. Can, um, can I? Steph, I'll start with you. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jan. If you want to say a few things, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I think that's it's wonderful, and that the future is for us to write you that it is about what we do going forward. And I'm looking forward to working with you and you with Manchester Histories and. And if there is anybody in the audience, then you know, we'd be happy to, to work with you in whatever way we can. I've put my email into the chat. I'm on holiday at the moment, but if you do email me, I will pick it up next week. Um, so, and it's been really, it's been a pleasure being here. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Jan. Um, thank you too. It was lovely to meet you all and, and um, hopefully we'll get some inquiries based on this. So thank you. And we're definitely going to go over, Steph, and look at your exhibition in the building, Stockford building. I think we've just started to be let out again. So it, it's just trying to, you know, see, it looks a fascinating uh, exhibition. I just want to thank Janine as well for putting this all together for us and um, getting you all here today. And I hope you will join us um, in our next salon, which is coming up. Remind me, Janine, I've forgotten. So is it... Oh, it's on the 17th of November, Wednesday the 17th of November, and it's on um, Roman and medieval Manchester. So, yep, I hope you'll be able to join us for that. And I just want to say thank you to those people as well who, who, who donated to Manchester Histories. Every penny helps, as they say. Um, but thank you, everyone, for, um, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to see you. And a big thanks to... Stephanie and Jan as well for your wonderful, insightful um, presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>